The United Leukodystrophy Foundation presents AGS, presented by Dr. Adeline Vandiver. Hi, good afternoon. It's Adeline Vandiver. Um, I'm from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I'm happy to be speaking with you today about um, acardi Goutier syndrome. I am having Keely um, move the slides for me, so thank you, Keely. Next slide, yeah. This is my, these are my uh, disclosures. I want to explain that um, we're working hard to partner with pharmaceutical companies um, and also our advocacy partners, and so I serve uh, uh, both of those um, uh, stakeholders, but I don't take any personal uh, funds, although we do get grant support uh, to advance our uh, clinical trials and research in um, leukodystrophin and, and in AGS in particular. Next slide. I also want to acknowledge our team that works very hard and, and make sure that everybody knows that although I'm presenting this data, I'm really doing so on behalf of many members of our team, and that includes in particular Dr. Laura Dang, as well as um, uh, Francesco Cavazzi, who are two physician leads on our program, and uh, Sakotak Onahashi, who's a PhD who works on our biomarkers, as well as our clinical research uh, team um, uh, who have worked very hard to make sure that this uh, data is accessible to people. Next slide. So the first thing I want to do is provide some updates on natural history in Icardi Goutier syndrome. And by natural history, I mean an understanding of what um, AGS looks like, which I think is very different than we thought uh, AGS looked like when we first uh, learned about this disease. Next slide. So we now know that, um, you know, in addition to a brain disease, AGS is really a very broad disease that affects uh, most of the body. It's a what we call a heritable interferonopathy, which means that you make... Uh, too much interferon, and that interferon unfortunately affects lots of organs um, in the body, and and in particular, you know, it affects um, organs that have uh, large numbers of blood vessels, um, and also organs that are susceptible to inflammation, like the muscle and uh, the liver and the brain. Um, and then there are other organs that it affects where we don't fully understand why it, it, they're affected the way they are, like the uh, eyes. We have much to learn about um, how AGS affects the body, but, but are no longer surprised that it affects uh, almost every um, organ in the body. And however, it's not obligatory for any one um, symptom to be present. So even you know the white matter changes and the um, calcium deposits that we know now are very much part of the disease or the skin involvement that is seen in a large percentage of children, those classical features don't need to be present uh, for, for somebody to have mutations in the genes associated with AGS. Next slide. Nevertheless, um, we know we think that suggestive features include um, uh, people, typically children, who have uh, changes in the way their brain works, which is uh, um, a medical word for that is encephalopathy, as well as problems with their uh, blood cells and their liver cells and uh, unusual rashes are things that should make you think about AGS. Um, there are also laboratory findings that should make doc should alert doctors to the possibility of AGS, and that includes having more white cells than normal in a lumbar puncture, um, some measures of inflammation, including neopterin and tetrabiopterin, and um, and then um, in some cases also um, a blood interference signature where that's available. And when those uh, symptoms are present, we're encouraging doctors to check. Um, the involved genes. It's important to know that not all the gene changes can be seen on an exome, so sometimes it's necessary to go back and recheck certain genes um, because they could be missed on a whole exome sequencing. Um, and then when uh, people are diagnosed, it's important to screen carefully all the possible affected organs to make sure you're not missing um, some symptoms um, of the disease. Next slide. So for people who don't already know, there is a um, number of different genes that can cause AGS, at least seven that we uh, know of now, um, and probably more because we have patients with AGS-like symptoms who don't have mutations in any one of these um, genes. Um, globally speaking, the first five genes that were identified, TREX1, RNAs H2A, RNAs H2B, and RNAs H2C, as well as SAMHD1, are all genes that um, disrupt the ability of the body to clear um, extra and excess DNA and RNA within the cell. And people think that that excess RNA and DNA makes the cell think it's infected by a virus. The most more recently identified uh, genes, ADAR1 and, and um, IFIH1, um, are genes that make proteins that specifically look for um, viral infections and sort of sound the alert when a viral infection occurs. And so um, the reason why everybody thinks that um, those all result in interference is because they all end up in one core pathway of sort of viral recognition. 
um, and in production of interferon. Next slide. You know, we already um, knew before that some of those genes present in a slightly different way. So, for example, we know that people with SAMHD1 might get um, involvement of their large blood vessels or their brain with a complication called Moya Moya. And we also knew that children with TREX1 might be more likely to have um, a more severe presentation. But as we've learned more about the disease, we now understand that, um, that you know, there are uh, differences in outcomes between people with different uh, mutations. So, for example, this is a, a sort of a heat map, a chart of what you might expect developmental milestones to be. And the, the dark blue, purplish color sort of means that, you know, fewer than 10% um, of people ever achieved a specific milestone. And then all the way up to the um, sort of dark red, um, you know, means that, that over 90% of people achieve a specific milestone. And so you can see, you know, that that overall patients with TREX1 have a harder time achieving milestones beyond things like smiling. Um, but that, um, and that's with the exception of course of people with familial chilblain lupus who are very mildly affected, but that, but that um, the SAM HD1, 8 or 95H1 might be much milder. There can be patients who are severely affected and there can be patients who are really very mildly affected with RNSH2B sort of in the middle ground. Okay, next slide. Um, you know, because we um, see so much variability, um, our group at CHOP recently developed a new scale to say, you know, how affected is a person by AGS? And so that scale encompasses a number of tasks that we um, understand that children with AGS are um, able to do sometimes and sometimes not able to do. And they include everything from, you know, social skills and speech um, all the way through uh, motor tasks, um, including walking. And you know how you sc score on that scale sort of gives us a sense of how uh, significantly affected the patient is with AGS. And when we look at that scale, next slide. When you you know when we test that scale on um, affected um, persons, right, with AGS, what um, what we know is that um, people with uh, AGS can um, you know initially. Uh, um, have more normal functioning and then uh, get worse, or they can um, initially have less normal function and get better. And what we what we know, and that's what the, the bottom right is trying to show, we're missing the other slides, is that um, people with AGS tend to have the most changes in their neurologic function in the first six months after disease um, onset. So that, um, you know, people have long felt that sort of AG, AGS is a disease where there tends to be like a big flare, um, and then a greater stabilization later. And, and, and we agree based on the scale that that's probably true, that people sort of have a lot of fluctuation of motor skills and abilities in the first six months of the disease and that those things tend to, to settle out uh, over time. Next slide, please. However, although that's true for um, a majority of cases, there's also a subset of patients with very atypical presentations and where um, they, um, will have um, initially some, and not all the colors are coming through, so I apologize because you're missing the sort of blue um, in the middle, but where initially patients will have um, be asymptomatic for a period of time, you know, even beyond a year of age, and then they may um, develop some um, challenges like developmental delay and things like that, and then develop a period where they might not be feeling well, but still be okay, and then have, um, uh, and then have a decline. And so sometimes it's hard to understand exactly Number one, where the beginning of the disease is, um, and to understand how, therefore, you know how much to, to be worried about things in the coming uh, months, and it's also um, hard to to understand. Um, uh, you know, it's also hard for people to diagnose these children because because people typically think of AGS as being something that occurs before a year of age in early infancy, with sort of a a slow progressive neurologic decline, people can misdiagnose these children who have acute neurologic decompensations um, as other disorders, things like ADAM or other um, leukodystrophies. There's also a subgroup of patients who have something called acute striatal necrosis, right? And that's particularly true for ADAR1. And that's where without white matter abnormalities, they have profound and significant damage to um, the basal ganglia, which is another word for the basal ganglia, striatum. And those are deep, deep pieces within the brain 
that are responsible for controlling uh, movement. Um, more rarely, people can have um, neuropathy or myopathy, um, and sometimes that can happen by itself, but more often it's mixed, it's mixed with other symptoms like spasticity, and it's often missed and yet can be a con significant contrib contributor to um, to problems with walking, um, you know, if not only do you have extra tone, but you also have um, problems with uh, weakness. And then finally, you know, a, a very important complication is moya moya or problems with um, large vessel disease. And so that is seen particularly in SAMHD1. And, um, you know, p families with uh, affected children with SAMHD1 should be alerted to the fact that um, even asymptomatic patients may benefit from a regular um, MRI just to make sure that that complication is not evolving. Next slide. Okay, I thought it would be important um, because people have heard a lot about it to talk about our um, our recent efforts at providing therapy for um, AGS. Next slide. So as, as people know, there are no currently sort of FDA approved therapies for um, AGS and people have uh, been trying therapies to modulate the immune system for a while um, now and, and that includes people trying things like prednisone um, or steroids, uh, trying IVIG um, and trying um, something called tocilizumab um, and cyclophosphamide, which are all things that modulate the immune system. And nothing had really been um, very uh, compelling, right? Um, there was also a thought that you might be able to use an antibody against um, the interferon, which is thought to be causing the disease. Um, that's been tried in lupus, but has not been tried in AGS. Um, there's uh, Dr. Yannick Krau's group uh, uh, did a small uh, pilot trial with um, HIV medications, which seemed to improve the interferon signature, but there were only a handful of patients um, in the trial. And you know, the challenge when you have trials that don't have a lot of people is it's very hard to know whether or not people were getting better. Um, because it's not enough people to sort of understand that. Um, and then also people have tried um, hydroxychloroquine, which is sort of the same category of medications that have been so talked about during the COVID-19 um, emergency. Um, and, uh, um, but, but that does not seem to be definitively um, effective. Okay. Um, next slide. So, um, you know, at this, you know, more recently, there's been a class of medication that's been uh, developed that are called Janus kinase inhibitors. And I wanted to show this pathway just to explain to people why people were hopeful that Janus kinase inhibitors might uh, work. So up top, you have one cell, right? At the bottom, you have another cell with the space in between the membranes of the cells um, where the green interferon is traveling, being the space in between the two cells. So, you know, in the first cell, you have, um, you know, you have those those genes that we talked about that were important in um, HES, you know, RNAs H and SAMHD1 and TREX1, right, that are all interacting to, to normally would clean up extra um, uh, RNA and DNA, right? But in this case, in the context of mutations, aren't doing that. And so those extra pieces of DNA and RNA are stimulating the cell to make um, interferon. That word is called induction, right? Similarly, right, you can have other systems that are meant to sort of monitor for um, the uh, presence of that DNA, um, and that's on the right there in purple, um, and that doesn't work when um, IFI 1 and 8 are mutated. But the end result is for all of them that you make extra interferon, that interferon is in green, and that that interferon is taken up by a special receptor on other cells. And what that interferon is meant to do is sort of sound the alarm for one cell to be able to tell another cell, hey, we have a problem, we have a viral infection, please mount your defenses and you know send out um, interferon. The problem is, is that when there's too much interferon, instead of just sounding the alarm, it causes um, it causes damage um, to the neighboring cells. So that interferon receptor, the way it works to send the signal, to send the alarm, is that when the interferon connects to the receptor, it activates something called a Janus kinase, which is an enzyme, which then sends the message within the cell that other things need to happen, right? And the Janus kinase inhibitors basically block the ability of that receptor to send the message within the cell. Next slide. So as a result of, of you know, our understanding of what that drug did, you know, uh, now uh, almost five years ago, we asked uh, one company that was making one of these molecules for to treat people uh, with rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis, if we could borrow the medication 
um, for AGFs. And so we opened up a compassionate use protocol with the company. This company is called Eli Lilly. Um, and Eli Lilly donated the drug, but but didn't really have any other involvement in um, supporting the, the study. They donated the drug and they also donated um, some of the tests to monitor how people were doing on the drug as far as the blood work, right? And during the, um, you know, during the trial, we had um, 42 people apply to be part of the trial. Um, 38 ended up entering um, the, uh, the trial. There were four people who, you know, had significant infections or were too sick, and we just felt like it wasn't in the best interest of that um, person to be on the trial, right? Three people who were enrolled, you know, just like I told you before, there are people with AGS who don't have definite um, sort of AGS as far as genotypes were in that group. And so we don't include them in our reports because we're not, while we know they have problems with interferon, we don't know for certain that it's sort of like everybody else. Um, so there were 35 uh, people um, ongoing in the study. And at this point, you know, many of these people, so this slide is, is uh, um, these numbers from, are from about six months ago. So at this point, you know, we really have um, everybody who's been on a medication for more than um, a year and some people who've been on medication for almost four years. Um, next slide. Um, one important thing to know about the group that was treated is that there are many more ADAR and IFIH1 patients than are typically seen in most um, um, groups. So that, you know, normally uh, um, their ADAR and IFIH1 are not like 40% of the overall rate of AGS. We have slightly more ADAR and IFIH1, in particular IFIH1. And then it's also important to note that we do have patients with all the different um, uh, genes and that um, most patients were a little bit older, right? So that we have um, uh, a mean age, you know, sort of the average age of treatment is six years, right? Um, and, uh, um, and that in many cases, these people had many years of, of disease. So sort of were well outside that six month age period where we would expect that they would still um, get better on their own, right? Next. Okay, and then, um, um, you know, we used different things to figure out if people were feeling better on the medication. We had people fill out a diary, right, which sort of looked at whether or not they had fevers and how they were acting and feeling that day. And the diary seemed to say that people were feeling better, both immediately and also in a sustained fashion throughout um, the study. Next slide. We also saw that that... Um, a specialized test which allows us to look at how the interferon is working in cells called the interferon signaling gene score, right, um, uh, was also much better in the beginning and then sort of stabilized back out. And part of the reason why it sort of crept back up a little bit on average is because you'll see, you know, in those sort of red dots on the right in the C version that, um, you know, plenty of, of uh, people still when they got sick, you know, might have a sort of a, a flare from the perspective of their interferon score. We didn't see people necessarily report feeling not well when that was happening, but we could definitely see the interferon fluctuate over time. Next slide. Um, one thing that we felt, you know, in a lot of people was significantly better were the skin findings, right? And kids with AGS can have lots of different um, skin findings, but, you know, some of the ones that we actually see more often than chillblains are some of these sort of generalized rashes, right? And, um, you know, for the little girl at the top, you know, she'd had a rash that was thought to be eczema her whole life, but it actually went away within a couple of days of starting the baricitinib. And, um, and also the, um, you know, children who had more significant rashes on their skin that were more problematic, um, they also seemed to uh, get a lot better over time. Um, in some children where we had to, you know, back off a little bit on the medication because there were concerns for um, infection, you know, we've then seen that, you um, that those rashes can come back. So we definitely think that they're modified by the treatment. Next slide. Um, we also, um, you know, saw people who might have had several months or years of, of pretty stable um, functional scores, right, as far as their neurologic function, seem to feel a bit better on the medication as far as their function. Now, these are not you know, dramatic changes because each point on the scale is one milestone, right? So you have to think that if you're seeing a person gain one milestone, one point, it's 
including it's basically gaining one milestone. But, you know, for the children or for the families, those changes um, can can be meaningful. And also, um, you know, overall, you know, there were a sufficient number of people who seemed to improve on the medication that it made us uh, start to think about, you know, why that might be. And we don't have definitive, um, um, we don't have definitive, just, just a second. Thank you. I have teenagers at home um, and like most of you, I'm working from home. And so I apologize. Um, so we don't have um, uh, definitive evidence of why people are um, feeling better from a neurologic perspective. And it might be, you know, as variable as the fact that uh, maybe their muscles are feeling better or maybe, um, you know, they're just feeling better overall because of decreased um, interferon signaling. Um, and I'm hoping we'll learn more about uh, why that's the case. Next slide. Um, I think, you know, a very important part to our thinking about these medications is what um, the side effect profile of these medications might be. And it's something that, you know, we worry about a lot. And, um, um, you know, this medication is likely something that children with AGS will have to take for a very long time. Um, and so we've looked carefully at, at what kind of side effects they can have. And the things we followed were things that people often... Um, have as abnormalities while on these medications. And one, and I'm sorry that these are so small, they're a little bit hard to read, but A is basically looking at whether or not people had changes with their white blood cells, right? Sorry, A is, sorry, A is actually anemia, right? Um, and, you know, there, there were patients who had uh, anemia, right, during the study, including one patient who had very significant anemia. Um, there um, were also, you know, more frequent changes with platelets. Now, those changes with platelets were platelets changes that were elevations, right? Um, where uh, people had elevations, you know, up to about a about eight or 900 of platelets. And we monitored those carefully and there's no evidence that those had any clinical effects. We definitely saw those and, and we saw those in a majority of patients, right? Um, we also saw people have, have um, you know, changes in their white blood cell count. And in particular, you know, we worry about decreases in white blood cell count. And we um, will occasionally see people have something called neutropenia, which is low white blood cell counts. And so that's something that we um, now, now, you know, more than when we did this study on the new trial, monitor for very carefully. Um, although my friends in, you know, in hematology and oncology tell me that the numbers that we're seeing are still very moderate uh, decreases and not ones that, that, that in their field they would consider um, clinically significant, which is somewhat uh, reassuring. In adults, um, uh, patients who take this medication um, can have elevations of their liver enzymes. Um, and so we, um, we monitored also those very carefully. And actually, we had people who had, like if anything, improvements on those liver enzymes. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and so there were not significant differences between before and after for people with um, AGS with abnormalities of their liver um, enzymes. So we don't think that those are uh, related to the uh, medication. And then finally, you know, there's some people who um, in the adults who had problems with muscle enzymes being elevated. And so we monitor those very carefully. And again, with the exception of, of one patient who, um, you know, where we think it was because of external causes that the muscle enzymes went up, we didn't really see that be a frequent um, complication. Next slide. Um, specifically as pertains to the liver function, um, you know, we had two children who had very significant liver problems at the beginning um, that we think were uh, improved by the medication because it was um, uh, improved when the medication was started. Um, you know, thankfully, most people with AGS have liver disturbances that don't cause clinical problems. So it turns out that when you monitor them, about three quarters of children with AGS have elevations in their liver function tests, but very rarely do they reach, you know, very elevated levels like these three children. And so, you know, we just don't have enough patients to know for sure if this was, if this would have happened anyways, or if this was a directly a relationship with giving the medication, but they did come down fairly rapidly after starting the medication to within near normal levels. Next slide. And then I think, you know, the last thing that's always sobering is that, you know, AGS is a severe disease. It's a disease that affects the whole body. And, you know, we do lose more children than I would ever like, um, um, both on and off um, 
uh, clinical trials, right? And so while on the study medication, this particular trial, the 38 individuals, two individuals have passed away um, while on um, this study medication. And one individual, um, the, the child died secondary to something called pulmonary hypertension, which at the time we didn't know was a complication of AGS. Now we, we know that and screen for that. And people don't think that that was related to the medication. There's a second individual who um, had had longstanding um, problems with anemia and also thrombocytopenia and who was treated with um, steroids in addition to the varicitinib. And that patient, um, after they passed away, they found that that patient had a fungal pneumonia. Um, and it's unclear at this point to what degree um, the um, high dose steroids contributed to that. Because that's a known, you know, having problems with, uh, in, you know, significant infections are a known complication of steroids, and how much the um, varicitin did contributed. But it has led us to be much, much more careful, and we are um, recommending that children with AGS not use steroids in combination with varicitin for that reason. And we're also monitoring. Um, children in the new trial um, more closely for uh, problems with um, their immune system. Next slide. So in conclusion, you know, um, I think the, the take-home message is that for the majority of children, varicitin appears to be reasonably well tolerated, but it does require careful monitoring. And I know, you know, lots of people are now starting to ask their doctors about um, varicitin and whether or not they can do it outside of a trial, which is, uh, you know, what our ultimate and long-term hope and goal is that people will be able to get this medication. But I want to emphasize that it's very important that um, children with AGS who are treated with baricitinib continue to be carefully monitoring, in particular for blood counts and for their immune system. And, you know, we have good reason to think, based on the study, that the baricitinib is affecting the interferon system, right, and that it is improving a number of things, including how people feel, how some target organs are involved, including the skin, right, and also potentially improving um, how children are doing neurologically for reasons we don't fully understand. And so I think, you know, baricitinib can be considered in as a tool to modify the, the, the disease course in AGS. And most importantly, I think it's really shown us that AGS can be a treatable condition even years after um, disease onset. And I think this these efforts, along with Dr. Crow's efforts using the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, have caused a lot of interest in AGS from pharmaceutical companies um, and trying to help us treat. And so I think that, that you know, if at the end of the day, hopefully we'll have a variety of different um, tools um, to permit us to modulate the immune system in AGS. And I feel much more hopeful, enthusiastic about the feasibility of treating um, um, AGS than I did even just a mere five years ago. Next slide, please. I think that regardless of whether or not you choose to participate in a clinical trial or choose to, to modulate the immune system for your family member with AGS, it's important to understand how AGS can affect the body because there's a number of things that you can um, look at and monitor and, and manage through careful medical management that likely will improve how children do and feel even aside from um, some of these novel uh, therapies. And so as we've, um, next slide please. As we've uh, learned about AGS, you know, we now know a number of new um, organ problems and, and, and have reinforced understanding of other organ problems to understand sort of how we need to manage and monitor children with AGS. So sort of going from head to toe, right? Um, you know, we know that the eyes, in addition to the brain, the eyes can be um, involved in AGS. And in particular, it's important to ask your eye doctor not just about ways to follow eye movement abnormalities and any potential need for glasses, but also to look at the eye pressures. That's typically something that's only measured in older adults. Um, but it's important to measure that in children with AGS because we know that children with AGS can develop a complication called glaucoma, which can uh, threaten the their vision because it can cause pressure um, on the nerve tracts that relay information to the brain. We also now know that, you know, that the occurrence of cardiac problems in AGS is unfortunately not a rare uh, complication. And those complications can include pulmonary hypertension, can include inflammation of the heart mess muscle, and can also include um, abnormalities of the big vessels that exit the heart. And so we really recommend that when a child with AGS is diagnosed, they see a cardiologist to check um, the heart, typically with an echocardiogram and an EKG. And also that 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 um, evaluation be repeated at least every other year, uh, if not more frequently, depending on any abnormalities found. Um, also, um, you know, in sort of 
new and, and, and not well-known complications, we know that the uh, inflammation um, in the gums can, um, can cause problems with uh, the root of the teeth. Um, and so we recommend that children with AGS be seen very regularly by a dentist, um, you know, at least every six months, if not um, every uh, three to four months for um, more uh, detailed cleaning and, and dental care to prevent any problems with the teeth over time. Um, we know that um, in about three quarters of children with AGS, there is some degree of involvement of the liver. Um, uh, you know, thankfully only in a minute proportion of those is that involvement you know, cause any clinical symptoms and any clear dam long-term damage to the liver. Um, we don't know though, however, how, you know, as children with AGS um, are living longer and longer, thankfully, how that sort of chronic low level inflammation may impact their liver function in later years. Um, we also know that problems with anemia, um, low white blood cell counts and uh, low platelets are much more common than we used to think. People used to think they only happened in newborn cases, but um, when you follow children over time, this appears to be a more uh, chronic problem that can recur. Uh, people think it's possibly uh, linked to antibodies being made against those cells um, by the body, um, and, uh, and those should be followed by hematologists if they happen. But we also recommend that a regular CBC or a white, you know, a cell count of the blood be done. Um, Children with AGS can develop a number of different um, hormone problems. The most common is thyroid disease, and we recommend a yearly uh, TSH. But also, less commonly, children can develop uh, problems with other hormones. Um, and, uh, and so atypical symptoms um, need to be um, looked at and, and addressed looking for uh, hormone problems. Um, the GI tract can be inflamed, and some children develop inflammatory bowel-like conditions that need special treatment. So if there's ever any blood in the stool, that needs to be brought to the attention of your doctors. Um, children can develop uh, problems with um, inflammation of the kidneys, like much like you can in lupus. Um, children can also develop problems with their muscles, right, with inflammation of the muscles that can cause weakness and further impact uh, neurologic function and things like walking. And then the skin findings can sometimes be quite significant and, and lead to uh, skin inflammation in some cases. And so this is an important thing to keep an eye on as well. So next slide, please. So in summary, when you think of a child with AGS and their potential different problems, um, uh, can Keely, can you hit next a couple of times? We should have appearance of a series of, yeah. So, perfect. Um, there should be one, one more. Maybe, maybe one more. Thank you. Um, oh, back. So in summary, you know, we recommend that uh, children have yearly blood work, right, um, including a urine uh, test and blood test. Uh, we recommend that people have, if you have SAMHD1, have a yearly um, MRI with an MRA, but you don't need regular MRIs in the other types of AGS. We also recommend um, that people have regular neurologic exams with careful attention to look if they have any evidence of weakness consistent with myopathy or neuropathy, um, that they have regular dental examinations, regular eye exams, and also that parents carefully review their child's skin to make sure there's no skin inflammation or um, breakdown. And finally, we recommend that um, a cardiologist uh, see the child at least every other year, but sometimes in some um, different uh, genes uh, yearly. Uh, to make sure that um, that that important organ and the lungs um, stay healthy. Okay, next slide. So, in conclusion, you know, AGS is a disease that can affect almost the whole body and needs a um, a careful management because it can affect different people in in different people in different ways, even the same uh, families. And so engaging with your uh, local health providers to make sure that your patient uh, or your family member has a, um, a good set of resources and a good team to address those problems is important even before complications develop and hopefully they may never. Um, and then it's also important to know that it's likely that this disease process can be modified and there's different um, therapies that are available now and probably more therapies that will be available in the future, but I'm much more hopeful about AGS treatment now than I um, have been um, in the past because um, there's so many medications that are developed for more common diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or psoriasis that may be able to help us uh, with um, AGS. If you are getting treatment with any 
drug that modulates the immune system, it's very important to for that person who's giving you that medication to be very familiar with the complications and the potential side effects, especially in Asia specifically of that medication. Um, and then finally, you know, there's a lot that can be done besides specific medications to help improve the health of an individual with AGS.